Okay, now what we've been talking about is what's going on in one single muscle cell, right? But moving, contracting one muscle cell is not going to do a lot of work for us. It's not going to help us in our day-to-day -day lives. But you've got to get the muscle cells going so you get the whole muscle going. So if we focus on just that single muscle cell, how much pulling force, how much tension is produced by that one muscle cell depends on a couple of things. It depends on how much overlap existed in the beginning. In other words, how much overlap, what were the zones of overlap between the myosin and the actin, the thick and the thin filaments? So that's the first thing that affects how much tension that muscle cell can produce. The second thing is how fast, how many neuron action potentials, how many signals are being produced by that neuron. How fast are those signals being sent? Is it one per second? Is it 10 per second? Is it a thousand per second? So that's what I mean by the frequency of stimulation. How many neuron action potentials are being sent to that muscle cell? How fast are they being sent? So that's how you maximize the tension produced in one muscle cell. How do you maximize the tension produced in a, in a whole muscle? It's how many muscle fibers are stimulated. Okay. So let's first talk about, we're still talking about that one muscle cell. Let's talk about this degree of overlap. If you go to exercise, what do they tell you to do before you exercise? Stretch. Stretch. Yeah, this is why. Now, you don't want to overstretch, but if you've been like me and sit on the couch for six months, <laughs> your muscles are probably like this. They're all tightened up. Scrunched on each other. Yeah. Well, if your muscles are too tight, you've got too much overlap. They can't contract much more. You're not going to get much force generated. Does that make sense? The Z lines are too close together. If they're too far apart, you only have a couple of mice and heads that can actually attach to the actin. So you don't want them overstretched either. You want them optimally stretched. You want them to the point where there's enough overlap that most of those mice and heads can attach to that actin filament and pull. But you don't want it want so much overlap that there's not much there's not much distance to contract. Now, stimulation frequency, how many signals are being sent from that neuron? The faster the signals, the more signals that neuron is sending out to that muscle cell, the more tension that muscle cell is going to produce, the more force it's going to generate. There are basically five different levels of contraction, if you will, of a muscle cell. The first one is called a twitch. Now, we're not talking about, you know what a tick is? You know, that's, that's a whole muscle that's twitching, okay? We're just talking about one muscle cell. So if you have the motor neuron, and the motor neuron sends down one signal, one stimulus, one action potential, and that action potential stimulates this muscle cell to contract a little bit one time, and then relax, that's a twitch. It's a stimulus contraction relaxation sequence. Now, there are three phases to this. There's a latent period. This is the period once that once that acetylcholine gets released, but before the cell does anything, that's called a latent period. And on this graph, what this is showing you is at zero, time zero is when that acetylcholine gets released from the, from the neuron. But the cell's not contracting yet. There's a little bit of time period between when the acetylcholine is released and when that cell begins to contract and produce force. That's the latent period. Now, what's going on, you already know. All of this stuff is going on. The acetylcholine is released. It binds to its receptors. What opens? Sodium channels open. Sodium enters the cell, and that causes the calcium channels to open, and the calcium leaves the sarcoplasmic reticulum. See, all of that has to happen. The calcium has to bind to the troponin. The tropomycin has to move. All of that stuff has to happen before the contraction cycle can happen. That's what's going on during this latent period. But once that calcium level gets high enough to bind to the proponent and the tropomyosin moves, then the contraction cycle begins and that cell starts to shorten so you get tension produced. Now, if only one signal comes down to the neuron, acetylcholine is released, but what's in this synaptic cleft? Acetylcholine has to race, right? And so, as soon as that acetylcholine is released, all this stuff starts happening in here. And while all of this stuff is happening inside the muscle cell, the acetylcholinesterase begins to break down the acetylcholine. 
And so you get just enough contraction to produce one kind of contraction and then it starts to relax again because the acetylcholine has been removed. The sodium channels close. The sodium gets pumped out. The calcium goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and contraction stops. Now, if we take this one little muscle cell, we've got it stuck on these pearl electrodes and we're torturing it, and we zap it once, if our electricity is like the, the neuron, the neuron action potential, and we zap it once and it goes bloop, at the very moment that it completely relaxes, if we zap it again, if another neuron action potential stimulates that muscle cell, do you think that the second peak, is that going to be higher or lower or the same? In other words, is that cell going to contract more strongly or not as strongly or the same? That's what most people would think. It would be the same. That's what I would think. But you actually get a little bit more. And we call that trepe. So trepe is that little bit increase in tension when you stimulate a muscle cell immediately after it relaxes. It's contracted once, it's completely relaxed, and you hit it again right at that moment. And so you can see in our little graph here, the cell contracts and relaxes, contracts and relaxes. It completely relaxes back down to where it started. See that? And then you stimulate it again. And what happens is the second contraction is a little stronger, and the third contraction is a little stronger, and the fourth contraction is a little stronger. The reason is, even though that muscle cell has completely relaxed, those calcium pumps haven't caught up yet. There's still some residual calcium in the sarcoplasm. And so when you hit it again, there's some calcium there, and now you just dump more calcium out so you can get more contraction. If you waited a few milliseconds before you hit it again, if you didn't hit it again right at the moment it relaxed, then you'd get the same thing because you would give time for the calcium pumps to catch up. Now, what happens if instead of waiting until that muscle cell completely relaxes, completely relaxes, we hit it before that. We give it another stimulation. You're going to get even more tension. This is called wave summation. And so it's not completely relaxed and you hit it again and it's going to contract more strongly and then it's going to contract more strongly and then it's going to contract more strongly. And again, there's a certain maximum tension that can be produced. So if you just hit it once, you just stimulate that muscle cell once, contracts and relaxes, that's called a twitch, right? If you stimulate the muscle cell repeatedly at the moment it relaxes, you get a little bit more tension produced, that's called trepe. If you stimulate the muscle cell before it completely relaxes, that's wave summation. And again, it's because this muscle cell hasn't completely relaxed, there's still a lot of calcium left out here. And then you hit it again, and you dump even more calcium in. So the more calcium, the more tension that's produced. The more active sites that are uncovered, the more mice and heads that can grab, the more tension that can be produced. If you, if you do wave summation, at a certain point you're going get, to get that cell to be contracting almost to its maximum level. And if you can get it to stay there where it contracts, relaxes a little bit, goes back to maximum, relaxes a little bit, goes back to maximum, this is called incomplete tetanus. The fiber doesn't stay completely contracted. It's still relaxing just a little bit. That's what we call incomplete tetanus. And so basically, every time it begins to relax, you stimulate it again. You get it contract, and you stimulate it again. See that? Now, if you send action potentials down this neuron so quickly that the muscle fiber doesn't relax at all, that's complete tetanus. Basically, any time acetylcholine is broken down, you're replacing it. Those action potentials are coming so fast that the level of acetylcholine stays the same. The enzyme can't catch up, so the sodium channels stay open, the calcium channels stay open, calcium levels remain high, and that muscle cell basically contracts and it stays that way. There's no relaxation. Tetanus, you've heard that word before, right? Before this, if I said tetanus, what would you think of? Call yourself a mouse step on a rusty nail, you get yeah. Tetanus, the word tetanus means contraction. Now, the disease tetanus is caused by a bacterium called Clostridium tetany. That bacterium produces a toxin that basically makes all of your muscles contract. 
So that's why the disease is called tetanus, because your muscles contract. Does that make sense? But the word tetanus itself just means contraction. So you've got good tetanus and then the disease tetanus, which is bad. <laughs> okay, so that's what's going on in a single muscle fiber. In a muscle, it's much simpler. The more muscle fibers in that muscle that are stimulated, the more force that whole muscle will generate. Now, I kind of, kind of alluded to this, kind of snuck this in on you, teased you a little bit about this earlier. <coughs> you can have one motor neuron. It's got one main axon and a whole bunch of axon collaterals, a whole bunch of branches. Each one of those little axon collaterals can stimulate a separate skeletal muscle cell. All of the skeletal muscle cells stimulated by a single motor neuron is called a motor unit. And so if you take this muscle here, or maybe this is just a, could be just a fascicle. And so you've got this red motor neuron that's stimulating the red ones. That's one motor unit. You've got another motor neuron stimulating another set, a different set of muscle fibers. That's a second motor unit. And a third motor neuron stimulating a whole other set. So maybe in a fascicle, for example, you might have three or four different motor units within that fascicle. So within the, the more cells in a motor unit, in other words, the larger the motor unit, the more muscle cells that it has, all of those muscle cells in that motor unit are going to contract together. They're all stimulated by that one motor neuron. And so once that action potential is generated, at the uh, initial segment of the axon, it's going to travel down all to all of these muscle cells. It's going to go down all the axon collaterals. So if a, mo if a motor unit has five cells, or if a motor unit has 50 cells, the larger motor unit is going to generate more tension, just because there's more cells contracting. So all of the cells in a motor unit are going to contract together. They're all going to get stimulated at the same time. Make sense? In an individual muscle, you may have 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, depending on how big the muscle is, different motor units. Now, we talked about picking up the suitcase. Can we talk about that? The empty suitcase and the thing goes up, your arm goes up. Yeah. <clears throat> your brain automatically calculates how many motor units in that muscle you need to use. If you're anticipating that thing being heavy, it may stimulate most of the muscle, most of the motor units in that muscle. And then so you generate this big force, but you really didn't need it. If you expect the suitcase to be empty, maybe your nervous system only turns on five of the motor units as opposed to 25. Does that make sense? So the bigger the motor unit, in other words, the more cells in a motor unit and the more motor units that are stimulated, the more force you generate. If you look at the muscles that move your eyes, they're only going to have a few motor units, and those motor units are going to be small, two or three cells maybe. Okay. The, the muscles that move your fingers, as opposed to the muscles that move your legs, your hamstrings, your quadriceps, your quads, these are going to have large motor units that have thousands of cells. You're going to generate large, powerful movements. need every motor unit in my deltoid to hold this videotape up, right? Maybe I picked up your textbook, I would. So I can hold this tape up for a while, right? What happens is, when I initially bring this up, maybe I've got 20 motor units in my deltoid. And maybe I needed five of those to do the initial lifting. <laughs> Now, those five are going to get tired. They're going to get fatigued. But I can still hold this up because those five motor units will rest, and another five motor units will kick in, take their place. Does that make sense? When I was doing this with the videotape, I was kind of, I just have gotten ahead of myself again, but I was talking about sustained contractions. When you hold something out like this, that's a sustained contraction. That's when, you know, I don't need all the motor units, but they rotate. So you can have sustained contractions. Think about, you don't have to think about holding your head up, right? But babies do. Babies have to learn 
to produce those sustained contractions, they have to learn how to hold their head up, right? But after you learn that, your body takes care of it already. Your nervous system takes care of it. But that's a sustained contraction. Or maybe I thought this tape was, or let's go back to the suitcase example. I thought the suitcase was empty, <laughs> but it wasn't. And so initially, my brain may activate five motor units. But once I realize that's not working, <laughs> it's going to go ahead and activate. It's going to go ahead and recruit some more motor units. That's what recruitment is. And so we don't have jerky motions. We have nice, smooth, controlled motions. Unless our brain gets fooled. Then we get that, oops. <laughs> Muscle tone is produced by a few of those muscle cells contracting all the time. And so when your muscles are toned, that means you've got more of those muscle cells in a state of contraction, which means you're burning more calories, you're using more ATP. What you're doing is you're raising your metabolic rate, your resting metabolic rate. So when you build muscles, when you exercise your muscles, you actually are burning more calories after you exercise, sitting on the couch, eating the chips and dip. Okay, another type of muscle cell contraction, and I've kind of already demonstrated this uh, as well. Isotonic contractions are the contractions that we normally think about. Isotonic. Iso means same. Tonic is referred to tension or force. So when a mu when you contract a muscle, or when you, when when you let's say I contract my biceps. I pull my arm. The muscle is shortening, right? But I'm producing movement. You contract that muscle, but you're, even when you are, when this muscle is contracting back here, you haven't completely relaxed this muscle, have you? You understand what I'm saying? So you can actually, a muscle can actually produce tension even if it's lengthening. Because it's not, you're not just flopping it down. You see what I'm saying? When you go to the gym and they say, all right, you want to push the weight up and then you want to slowly lower it down. Those muscles are still producing force even though they're getting longer. Okay. So isotonic contractions are contractions that produce movement even as a muscle can shorten or lengthen. When a muscle shortens as it produces movement, that's called concentric. So you can have concentric isotonic contractions. That's normally, that's the ones we normally think about. But you can also have eccentric isotonic contractions. When you straighten your arm, if you do it in a controlled, a slow controlled fashion, you've got the triceps doing concentric isotonic contractions and the biceps doing eccentric isotonic contractions. An isometric same movement, no movement, or same same measure. Isometric is when you hold something out like this. Now, these muscles are contracting, but nothing is moving. Does that make sense? Holding your head up, those are isometric contractions. All right, we talked about the fact that muscles only produce pulling forces. Even though a muscle is getting longer, it's still pulling. Okay. But when a muscle relaxes, it's passive. The quickest way, of course, is to have an opposing muscle group. Biceps contracts, then the triceps contracts, and that helps stretch the biceps back out. Gravity, okay. If you think about it, if you let your head drop, gravity stretches those muscles back out. And then we talked about, when we were talking about the amount of overlap, if you really, really, really contract your biceps <coughs> and then just relax, it's going to get a little bit longer just because you've squashed all that tissue, and it says, ugh, I don't want to be squashed. If you've ran those Z lines up against the ends of the thick filaments, the thick filaments are going, get off of me. Does that make sense? <laughs>